Okay, I think we're going to get started now. Um, welcome. Thanks for joining another rolling road trip. And a big thank you um, to everyone who made a donation for this program. All of the programs we've been doing during the pandemic have been on a pay what you wish basis. Um, and we really want to do that to support our community and to make our programs accessible during this time. Um, and every donation any amount really helps the museum run programs such as these. It also helps us in our work collecting and preserving Roebling's history. Um, and eventually it'll help welcome visitors back to the museum to view our exhibits, which we are really looking forward to. Um, so just an introduction of me, my name's Lynn Calamia and I'm the new executive director at Roebling Museum. I probably should stop saying new. I've been here for almost a year, but with a pandemic year, I don't know if it fully counts. So I think I get to say it a little while longer, um, but I've been having a great time getting to know the town, the people who live there now, the people who lived there um, in the past as well. And um, I guess for those who haven't actually visited Roebling Museum yet, and I hope that you all do come for a visit once the pandemic's over, um, the Roebling Museum is located in a company town in Roebling, New Jersey, which is in central New Jersey, right on the Delaware River. Um, the company town is listed on our national, the National Register of Historic Places. It was built in 1905, and surprisingly, it remains almost fully intact architecturally. So our museum is built, it's inside of the uh, the main gate that the workers would walk through, um, and you, the the factory was a wire rope factory and a steel mill, um, and our indoor and outdoor exhibits and programs really bring to life the story of those people who did work in the factory and people who lived in the company town, as well as the big impact of the Roebling family and the Roebling company. Um, but today we're going on a Roebling road trip. So we're going to leave the museum and we're going to go to another state even, which is so exciting. Um, and for the first timers for our Roebling road trip program, um, these have been a series of virtual programs that take viewers around the country to visit with people at Roebling related sites. So, so far we've been to a bridge in Cincinnati. Um, we've been to the Allegheny Portage Railroad, been to um, Saxonburg, which is a town founded by John Roebling, been to the Brooklyn Bridge, of course, um, and there's much, much more on the way. Um, and if any of you who are paying attention today, um, if you have any ideas of where we should go next, if other, other Roebling road trip places or even like concepts, we, can, we could fit those in um, as future events. And just a, a really quick overview of how the program's going to run today. Our guest, Bill Merchant, he's going to be giving us an illustrated lecture. You can see this is his first slide, very exciting. Um, and while he's talking, please submit the questions as he's going. Don't and if you have one, just type it out as it occurs to you, um, because I'm asking the questions as they come in. And then when he's finished with his presentation, we're going to do Q&A. Um, and have a little conversation about, about the topic. So just gonna keep my remarks pretty short and let's, let's get started. Bill, are you ready? I'm ready. <clears throat> so thank you very much for having me, uh, Lynn and the Roebling Museum. It's a real pleasure. I'm, uh, I'm yet to, uh, to visit myself and when things get better, hopefully this year, I'll have to come down your way and, and, and learn some more about John Roebling. Uh, so the topic is John Roebling and the Delaware and Hudson Canal. And I want to thank both the Roebling Museum, but I also a shout out. Let's see if I, don't you always, okay, there we go. Uh, uh, my, my thanks to Professor Paul King, who is a, a, a architecture professor at the City College of Technology. And he's writing the book, Roebling Before the Bridge. Uh, he's a friend and a colleague and very generous with, with his time and his knowledge. And a lot of what I know and understand about John Roebling is because of my, my friendship and uh, work relationship with, with Professor King, who I understand will be presenting a Roebling road trip later this season. So if you enjoy this and you want to know more than you ever knew about John Roebling, Paul's your guy. He's great. Uh, I've been to a couple of his presentations and I've learned so much about uh, suspension bridges and the work of John Augustus Roebling. But we're going to talk today about John Roebling's relationship with the DNH Canal. Um, <clears throat> for those of you who don't know, uh, the DNH Canal was a very important waterway in early American history. It, it was one of the many anthracite um, coal uh, canals 
So the DNH Canal Company was really a company that, that existed to uh, market anthracite coal. Um, and it was for, formed by Quakers, uh, the Wartz brothers, uh, who were Philadelphia Quakers who had a, um, oh, a contract with the US government to supply uniforms uh, for the war effort, the War of 1812. So by my lights, the story of the DNH Canal starts with the War of 1812. They were shipping coal. We used to get our coal from England, but it was actually uh, um, cheaper to ship across the Atlantic Ocean than by land in America in 1812. But 1812 starts this crisis. The Wurtz brothers get coal bearing land uh, in, in Pennsylvania from the US government because the government didn't have enough money. Uh, and this starts the story of the DNH Canal, which becomes a really important uh, industrial waterway and really the template for a lot of the industrial activity that took place in the 19th century. I like to say that it fueled the Industrial Revolution. As it started, it was built in 18, from 1825 to 1828, and it was originally 32 foot wide on the top, 16 foot wide on the bottom, uh, four foot deep, and it carried boats that were nine foot wide, 75 foot long, and carried 30 tons of coal. It ran from the town of um, Honesdale in Pennsylvania, named for Philip Hone, its first president, followed the Lackawaxen River to the confluence of the Delaware and the, uh, the Lackawaxen. We'll talk about that a little more in a minute. Followed the Delaware River at Port Jervis, named for the second chief engineer, John Jervis, who we'll also uh, mention a little later on, or I will. Uh, followed the Neversink River Valley up through here, joins the Roundout Valley around Ellenville, and, and terminated at the Roundout on the Hudson in the city of Kingston. Still 75 miles from its intended market of New York City, but the Shoengum Mountains were a barrier. Uh, so this was the quickest and best route. Uh, and indeed it does get built and it was really important uh, American story. Uh, and, and, and we at the DNH Canal Historical Society are trying to make more Americans aware of this important part of their past. Uh, and here's just to give you an idea of what life on the canal throughout the 19th century was. Here's Rosendale, the next town over from me here in uh, High Falls, New York, and uh, um, gives you an idea what it was like throughout its uh, roughly 75 year run. I love this map. To me, it's the Magna Carta. It's the, it's the, it's like the founding document. It's a map that was um, made based on a survey done by engineers from the Erie Canal originally, working under uh, Chief Engineer Benjamin Wright of the Erie, who was hired by the DNH company. Uh, and, and this is the, a route map that they put out to, uh, to get investors because they raised over a million dollars to fund this in a single day. They're the first million dollar private enterprise in American history. That money was raised on Wall Street at the Tontine Coffee House. But I don't wanna get bogged down because I've got a half hour or so. Um, so let's take a little closer look. They built their, their um, canal from what was then the Forks of Dyberry. So right here, it becomes Honesdale. But that coal land was over here. I love the namings of, of towns in early American history. They dubbed this town Carbondale. <laughs> uh, Carbondale was basically just the Wurtz Brothers mine. Uh, but they had a real problem and that was about 900 foot. So Carbondale's at about 900 feet above sea level. You've got the 1900 foot Moosic Mountains here. And they had to get their coal from Carbondale to Honesdale. So this took some engineering know-how. <clears throat> and to that end, <clears throat> they built the DNH Gravity Railroad. <clears throat> and uh, this is a picture of the famous Shepherd's Crook. And you can see that it was such a, a, a long uh, uh, bend here that you could actually, they say you could actually uh, um, you know, slap hands. I think that it's an exaggeration, but uh, they passed very closely uh, on its way down. And it was referred to as a gravity railroad because it used the weight of the laden cars descending to, um, to pull the other cars. So all the cars were connected. So John Jervis came over from the Erie Canal under Benjamin Wright, where he learned engineering. Um, and he, gets, he becomes the second chief engineer of the DNH Canal Company, uh, just in time to design their gravity railroad. And Mr. Jervis designed it. All the trains had to be connected. It was about a 17 mile railway. Uh, and it had five ascending planes and three descending, so a total of eight planes. This is a wonderful drawing of some of the, the, the machinery that uh, John Jervis had, uh, had designed um, to make this, this innovative um, railway. And there were any number of gravity railroads. In fact, uh, um, 
Um, and most of them in Pennsylvania, now that I think about it. Uh, that, that's an interesting thing to look up, if anybody out there knows of a gravity railroad that wasn't in Pennsylvania. But I digress. <clears throat> well, they had a, problems. Uh, steel making, iron making was in its infancy. So many things in America in this period, we're talking 1828, roughly, um, wasn't all that good. And so they had problems with the chains breaking. And, and these gravity railroad cars carried about four tons of material. And there were many, many cars. I've read things claiming there were only four cars in a row, but I've seen way too many pictures where there's dozens of cars. And you, you can imagine the, 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 uh, the havoc that would be wreaked if a chain broke. So the DNH company just went over to hemp rope um, because at least it was uh, uh, available, fairly inexpensive. Um, but, but hemp rope, you know, you leave it out in the you know, the, the hemp rope isn't gonna last. I think the ropes even for the boats lasted maybe a season. So hemp was available, wasn't the best material, but at least hemp rope, you'd look at it and you'd know when it was gonna fail because it would be frayed. It wouldn't just fail on you in the way that the, uh, that the iron did. But here in, in their uh, 1831 annual report, there's a list of their expenses. And, and what do we see? Um, but, and I'm, I'm, uh, they, they spent $3,734.52 for ropes for the planes, amongst other things. But this was expenses on their gravity railroad. And the other interesting thing about the DNH, because it was started by, um, by Quakers, they honored the Sabbath. The DNH closed down every, every Sunday. Uh, and, and navigation stopped. Well, end of the season, navigation kept going. You did not want your boat to get frozen in on the canal. But for the most part, they honored the Sabbath. But what this meant is that every Saturday night, a crew of men went out and took down 17 miles of hemp rope and then put it back out Monday morning. Uh, um, you can imagine the effort that that took. This was kind of a problem. And as the canal got more successful in the 1840s, um, they really needed to do something different. Um, by this time, James Archibald is now in charge of the Gravity Railroad. Uh, Jervis kind of moved on almost right after the canal opened onto other things. Uh, Jervis himself has a storied career beyond the DNH canal, but it was very important to it. Um, but uh, James Archibald meets John Roebling. So this is when John Augustus Roebling, German immigrant who invents, they say, wire rope. Certainly there was talk of making uh, um, rope out of wire in, in Europe when he studied engineering in the Germanic, uh, I forget the town now, but um, um, John Roebling actually starts making rope out of wire, and, and his earliest purchasers were these gravity railroads. So J James Archibald purchases that wire rope from the Roebling Wire Rope Company, uh, and problem solved. And now he's on their radar. Uh, and in, I'm told that, that uh, actually the wire rope business makes John Roebling one of the wealthiest Americans in the 19th century. Um, so he, he has a great idea, sees a need, and he figures out how to make it. They originally make the rope on his uh, on a wolf, uh, the rope walk in Saxonburg, but they eventually open up in Camden, New Jersey. So this is even before the town of Roebling uh, is made, and I'm presuming Roebling isn't too far from Camden. So so now now the uh, the DNH is know about John Roebling since they're purchasing product from him, and throughout the the 1840s. The canal company, after kind of a rough start, they were marketing surface coal. They were getting, they had a bad reputation for a few years. It took them a while to get going. But by the 1840s, they're doing so well that they start doing improvements on the Gravity Railroad and they start uh, increasing the capacity of their canal by making it deeper. Easy enough to do. It was four foot of water, could carry ton, uh, boats that could carry 30 tons of coal. Um, they, they make it a foot deeper between, I think it's about 43, 44, 45. That's so successful, they make it another half deeper, but at the same time, they start thinking to go bigger. Um, the, the gravity is rebuilt numerous times. I think it's five times. I'm, it's a shame. I don't think Dr. Powell, uh, kind of a, a gravity railroad expert, is with us today. I got an email saying he couldn't get on. He'll have to watch it on, on DNH TV or, or on uh, uh, the Roebling Museum's uh, channel. The DNH Canal had 22 aqueducts. You know, when I first started getting into the canal lore, you know, you, you never thought about the idea that you need an aqueduct to carry the boats over bodies of water. The DNH Canal was completely gravity fed uh, and, and it passed many waterways. They were built in, in river valleys because you could find an area where you could go the longest without having to have a lock, without changes in elevation. And also you had a source of water. So when as the canal made its way down 
uh, if you had water higher than the canal, you figured out a way to get into the canal, but you didn't just have your waterway open out into bodies of water because then all that hard won water is lost. So 22 aqueducts total, but during their final enlargement of 1850, they, they grapple with a few problems. So here's a wonderful pair of maps from a, an 1854 survey. We're very fortunate, partially through uh, Professor King's efforts and that of the Delaware and Hudson Transportation Heritage Council, of which I'm president. Uh, um, we managed to get digital copies of these maps. The originals are two foot by three foot, and, and we have all 80 some of them. And this is two of the maps right here, number 28 and 29. Um, and they show you the confluence of the Lackawaxen and the Delaware rivers. And so from the start, let's see if my pointer will show you there. Here's the old canal route, pre-enlargement. And when they got to the Delaware River, they, had a, uh, they couldn't just let that water all go out into the Delaware. They had a guard lock, they had a rope ferry, and you, you put the animal, at this point, a single animal pulled the boats. And uh, they just used the rope. They pulled themselves across this rope um, right over here. And then, then there was another guard lock and they continued on the canal. And here's an even closer picture, which even though I didn't ask for that, that's fine though. Um, you get a, a better look, a little close up. Um, down here, they had this dam. Well, they needed this to have what they called the Delaware Pond to enable them to make sure they had enough depth of water throughout the season. Um, they had this dam here, but this put them, put the DNH company up against the raftsmen, the guys that for probably a hundred years previous to this, if not longer, had been running timber down the Delaware River to market in Philadelphia and anything down the Delaware River. Uh, and they really didn't like this dam. In fact, I think at least once they went and destroyed parts of that dam. Um, so it was a constant problem with the DNH and they were consistently through their history even after the 1850 enlargement, they were um, they were paying out money to alleged damage done to the rafts that the rafts were made and stuff. So it, it was a constant fight. The raftsmen thought it was their river. It was hard for them to share. <coughs> they weren't sharing very well. Um, so when the DNH decides to to um, enlarge, now they're going to enlarge their entire canal. Ultimately, it, it gets to a, a, a water depth of six feet. And it's anywhere from 32 to 50 foot wide. And the boats now are um, 14 and a half foot wide and 91 foot to begin with long. And it eventually carry 130 uh, um, tons of coal. So while they're working this, there are various changes they made. And one of them was they realized that because of the problem with the raftman, they wanted to build an aqueduct. But so, the, so the, the, the logical thing would have been to replace this section right here, this rope ferry, with, it, with an aqueduct. Um, but in fact, the owner of that area, uh, Mr. Holbert, Benjamin Holbert, um, he, he was a little bit, he, he was a supporter, I believe, of the Erie Railroad. At any rate, he was a little antagonistic. And, and, and a lot, you know, when they were laying out the canal, they, they didn't even tell anybody what they were doing. They don't do anything in Pennsylvania to the final year of construction. They're already afraid that people are gonna gouge them, that they're gonna want more money than, than the company wanted to spend. Uh, and they had an issue where they didn't think that Benjamin Holbert was gonna be very uh, willing. And so instead they contract John Roebling to build a pair of aqueducts. Um, he had already built his first aqueduct in Pittsburgh. So there was, a, there was an aqueduct that he could uh, he could show to other, other people. And the DNH was aware of all of that because they examined that before hiring him. But they have him build a, a, one over the Lackawaxen River here and one over the Delaware River here. And that was largely because they just wanted to avoid dealing with Mr. Holbert. I mean, they ended up spending some $80,000, uh, a lot of money in that era to have Mr. Roebling build these, uh, these aqueducts. In fact, what he actually does is um, he does all the aqueduct part the masonry is subcontracted out and was the responsibility of the DNH company. And here we've got a great picture of, uh, of Roebling's Delaware Aqueduct uh, built between 1847 and 1848. Um, people didn't trust these things. They didn't understand displacement. Famously on the Erie Canal, they had a waylock and originally the waylock used water displacement. Everybody thought it was voodoo. They ended up replacing it with a mechanical lock. And there was a similar thing with this aqueduct when, when uh, even though there had been one functioning, uh, um, the people around here didn't know about that. Uh, uh, apparently, everybody wanted to watch when the first boat went, went over, thinking that the additional weight would, would uh, collapse the aqueduct, not understanding that displacement 
was such that the, the, the weight on the aqueduct didn't change one iota. And John Roblin was a very, very good engineer and uh, never had a failure in any of his bridges or aqueducts, uh, unlike other suspension. He wasn't the first guy to build suspension structures. Uh, he's just the first guy to build them uh, um, so, so successfully. Uh, and here is a, uh, a shot, I think about a year ago I, I took. And uh, that Delaware aqueduct needed four spans to, to bridge a 1600 foot total span. And you can see what happens is there's a anchorage down in here. Um, there's very strong stone that the wire rope, the wires go over. And you can see all along there, four spans and each one, all the weight of the water and that wooden trunk are, are carried, are attached to and carried by that. A series of four, and they're all anchored on either side of the, uh, either side of the shore. Um, tons and tons uh, buried in the ground to support all this weight. Uh, fascinating structures and one that of course becomes repeated in bridges and, and aqueducts. Uh, bridges more because we're already, you know, the, the, the era of the canal, uh, um, Canal fever is really only that 75 years that the DNH runs, although certainly things like New York's Erie Canal operate to this day. And likewise, at the same time that he's building the Delaware Aqueduct, um, here's another great shot. Uh, um, they're building the Lackawaxen Aqueduct. And even though the final enlargement isn't complete until 1850, they do the rerouting here because they end up, uh, um, the levels change. So they eliminate some locks on the Pennsylvania side and they come, they, they wind up higher on the New York side, and you can actually walk all of this today. Um, this is the only extant Roebling aqueduct of the four that he built for the DNH company in this period, uh, um, just between 1847 and, and 1850. Um, but this is the only one that, that served a purpose in the post canal era. It is now administered by the National Park Service. It's been largely restored to be pretty much like what, what, it, what it was in the day, except that now you drive through the prism through the area rather than having it hold water. But, but if you live in the area, it's well worth the trip. And you can also then on the New York side, you can see the remains of the early canal route and you can Sorry, see- Sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. Sorry about that. That's my other device talking to me. Um, <laughs> so, so here's a wonderful shot from the New York side now. Uh, um, and as I say, <clears throat> he put these went into service before the final enlargement. Uh, and they couldn't have been happier. Um, it, it saved them an awful lot of uh, an awful lot of trouble. Don't have a lot of pictures of the Lackawaxen Aqueduct, uh, but here is one of the few that we do have. I think you're going to see virtually all the pictures of of uh, this particular aqueduct that I've ever seen. And so this was, as you can see, um, it was a, a two span with a with a central pier. And this central pier gets destroyed in a huge flood that wreaks a lot of havoc on the entire DNH in 1862 and has to be completely rebuilt. Um, and, and that I think might be the only real damage that ever happens on any of uh, Roebling's four aqueducts. Uh, this had two, two spans of 114 feet each, so a total of 228 feet span. Uh, none of this is left except for the, I'm gonna say the Western, um, the Western trunk. Here's a great shot. So here you've got the, uh, if you really want to understand, this is clearly now, this is where the water would have been. So you can see that it's, that, uh, um, it's pretty well gone. So this is in the post-canal era. Um, here is the wire up over the, what, what they called a pyramid. Um, he, here even is the towing path is, look at all that damage there. So this must be uh, in the 19 knots, I'm gonna say, probably. But uh, I've been there recently with my friend, Professor King. And one of the things we noticed, I'm gonna show you two of them, right here, so here's this pyramid. So that's the stonework there is this piece here. In the ground is a pair of iron, these are about four inch rings. For the life of me, I'm not sure what they're there for. I've seen at the High Falls Aqueduct, um, there's an actual snubbing post, a stone post, because all of these aqueducts and bridges on the DNH canal were single traffic. So the canal was wide enough to allow boats to pass in either direction, but each aqueduct bridge and lock was a single passage. Um, I have no idea what these rings are, are there for. I always love having things like this. If anybody has any ideas, you know, let me know. I'm, I'm still scratching my head. I mean, it seems futzy to tie a boat up to that. And why a pair of them? I mean, I have so many questions, but that's what I love about history. It, uh, um, 
you always you go looking for answers, but you always get some fun questions as well. Here is now um, this is that Western uh, um, uh, uh, pyramid. I'm going to say is what uh, Professor King tells me. Uh, John Rowling referred to it as. But an interesting thing we noted a couple months ago when we were there. If you take a look, every one of the blocks has got Roman numerals on it, and if you look more carefully, they correspond one. Or let's see, that's two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So these were marks put, and, and even nine. These were marks put in the in the quarry for the stone, so that each layer was put in the proper spot. And I've, I'm, I'm I'm looking at the other aqueducts. I haven't been to the one over the Never Sink to see if I can find more of those marks. I found one of these marks on one of the stones at my local Roebling aqueduct uh, of the one over the Roundout Creek that we'll get to next. And in fact, Chief Engineer Russell Farnham Lord was so happy with John Roebling's work that he, he writes to their president uh, in February of 1850, the Delaware and Laco accident aqueducts were brought into use last spring and approved valuable improvements to the navigation being also substantial and permanent structures sustaining all that has been claimed for the utility of wire suspension aqueducts there have been nine days here the past season that boats could not have crossed the delaware pond on the former plan of crossing during freshness in the river with the aqueduct the navigation has not been interrupted at, at that point during the season so he's he's immensely happy with that eighty thousand um, dollar uh, expenditure and these wind up so successful that um, that they, because they're enlarging, um, aqueducts had to be rebuilt, and they had to be rebuilt um, to hold more water, and they had to be rebuilt wider. And so here is the Never Sink Aqueduct over the Never Sink River in Cutterbackville. I was noticing as I was pulling this together, and it's interesting. They call this one the Never Sink Aqueduct, but they call the one in High Falls the High Falls Aqueduct. And all I can think of, rather than the Roundout Aqueduct, which is the body of water it carries the canal or carried the canal over, uh, I, I just have to think that the Cutterbackville was a little too much for him. But uh, but there you have it, the Never Sink Aqueduct. This is a single span now, uh, as are both of these, and this replaced an aqueduct built by John Jervis that was multiple spans and had a wooden trunk. Uh, so this took uh, um, by by being suspended above the river, and I believe this one also was higher than the. Uh, than the earlier one, <clears throat> um, they, they just, whatever's going on in the river is no longer a problem. Uh, unlike the Lackawaxen where the pier was taken out and uh, you can see the Delaware, they had those big massive piers, uh, all the ice and the freshets and, the, and, and the, 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 the winter activity, high water activity would be a problem. <clears throat> and here we have, we're very fortunate at the Canal Society to have um, some of Russell Farnham Lords, most of his stuff is down in the Mini Sink Valley Historical Society. Uh, and I've got to get down there. I, I need to get copies of all of his correspondence because it, he, it's a treasure trove of, of information about the canal and how it operated. But this is a page out of, we were fortunate enough to get donated a correspondence journal. And it, it appears to be all or most of the correspondence that uh, Russell Farnham Lord did in between 1849 and 51, I think it was, uh, a, a great period to have. I discovered another one at Mini Sink Valley that it didn't look like anybody had spent any time with. I intend to get down there uh, in, in my free time, get down there and, and go through all of these eventually. But this is great just because it, it, here, here's the level. Russell Farnham Lord wasn't uh, an engineer engineer as much as he was a management engineer. Um, to my knowledge, he didn't engineer anything, but he oversaw all of the engineering works. He was chief engineer of the DNH Canal from 1828 till 1862, and then he steps down as chief engineer but continues working for them until he uh, passes on in 67. But he keep, kept these wonderful notes, and I, and I think it's interesting here to see, um, you know, the depth of water and that they calculated for six and a half feet. Makes you think that they're thinking that they might want to even increase their capacity. They never did ever get past the, uh, um, the, the, the that six foot mark um, of water. And, and some people say 140 tons of coal. I think for the most part, the most I'm seeing is 130, 132 from primary source documentation. Um, but uh, it's great to have these things and, and the level of detail is, is amazing. It's really wonderful. And here's a, a great bird's eye shot, very popular in the 19th century. This is a stereo view slide. Um, we've got any numbers of variations on this shot, multiple shots, but this is great because it can show you the Roebling Aqueduct over the Roundout Creek. And there is the 
probably, we don't know for sure, but probably a John Jervis stone aqueduct that it replaced. Um, and you can see that the, the, the here in High Falls it crossed once again uh, at a higher, I forget whether it was one lock or two um, over that. And, and at this point in time, um, in, in 1872, I should say, High Falls was really hopping because the DNH Canal came through. It had two churches, two hotels, two meat markets, a grist mill, and many cement mills. In fact, there were eight mills total um, harnessing the power of the High Falls that gives the town its name. Uh, so the, the, the canal company was immensely happy with the work that, uh, that Roebling did for him. And in fact, uh, uh, a um, Lorenzo Sykes, who at the time, he later worked for the DNH, the time he worked for the Morris Canal, and we have in this correspondence journal a letter just lauding John Roebling for, for his work, for his aqueducts. Uh, I'm a, I, and he says, I'm decidedly of the opinion that the plan is designed and executed by John A. Roebling, Esquire, secures the best combination of woods and iron that has ever been affected for works of the kind. Um, so you know, this is sort of the beginning of John Roebling. Uh, um, you know, he, he becomes the master of the suspension bridge, uh, never had a bridge fail. I'm told that there was a bridge in Pond Eddy over the Delaware based on a Roebling design that failed, but that's not the same thing. Here's a great shot. This is uh, in the stone on the uh, north um, trunk or north abutment of the Roebling Aqueduct here in High Falls. And it's got his name. It's got the name of the Mason. This is uh, Mr. Watson. Uh, I'm unclear as to whether Watson did all of the, the, uh, the masonry work. Uh, Professor King tells me that uh, they had some problems with them here in High Falls, and that even though the Cutterback Mill and, or I should say, Never Sink and High Falls Aqueducts were started at the same time, uh, the High Falls one took a little longer because of problems with the masonry work. But never a problem with Roebling's work uh, uh, that I've seen in any of the correspondence. Nothing but happy with, the, with, with what the man did for him. <clears throat> a great shot of uh, the side view of, of that single 145 foot span. Oh, thank you. Yes, uh, I, I see David. Uh, it wasn't the, it was the Berryville Shahola Bridge. You know, once, uh, um, <clears throat> you know, once you get a reputation, you, you want to stand by it. Uh, I, I, I see that uh, Michael Vock had a question about a Google map of all the aqueduct locations. You're getting ahead of me a little, but if you go to canalmuseum.org, we have a, a link to our YouTube channel where there's a, a lot of video and presentations like these, shorter videos, some out in the field some giving a tour of our old museum and now we're doing tours of our new virtual museum but also there's a link to a google map that uh that i created with the help of many people that has the location of all of the aqueducts it's got all the publicly accessible dnh sites and it's got links to video shot on those sites as we release them on dnh tv um but now here's another page from the lord journal and this is uh he would recapitulate the expenses every year for the annual report. In fact, we see in the annual reports, I've got the letters and then I see directly quoted Russell Farnham Lord. They spent a grand total of $45,406.09 on those two uh, suspension aqueducts. And that was just to John Roebling. So presumably that might not include the masonry. Um, but I have to laugh at the nine cents, <laughs> even the $6 when you think about it. But yes, it was $45,406.09. But Let's take a look for a minute. The second item on here is a payment to Jacob H. Depew for real estate and water power in High Falls, and they spent $20,000. And what did they purchase for that $20,000? That was on March 12th of 1850. Uh, and it's those wonderful maps that give me that exact date. Um, one of the things they purchased was Simeon Depew's Tavern, now owned by his son, Jacob. Both Simeon and Jacob were, were employed by the canal company where Simeon, or, or Jacob, excuse me, the son was well-respected, um, um, worked a lot for the canal company. But uh, in 1850, he comes down with, according to Lord's Journal, a serious rupture. Um, he thinks he's dying. And so he sells property. There was a cement mill that they immediately sell off to somebody else. There was property either side of the falls. Uh, and there was this wonderful building, the Depew Tavern, uh, known as the Stonehouse Tavern back in the day. Uh, in the 20th century, became famous as the Depew Canal House. Uh, uh, visionary chef John Novi kind of puts the town of High Falls back on the map in uh, the late 1960s by getting four stars from Craig Claiborne in the New York Times, having a restaurant here. 
Um, but the canal company buys this at the same point that the, that the um, canal, which used to go over here, then was rerouted. The route was too serpentine in High Falls. And again, they, they decide to cross the round out higher than they were. So there's a, a rerouting, they lose a couple locks. So as a consequence, locks are devices for raising boats over changes in elevation. Most of the DNH locks had 10 foot of lift. These in High Falls and our National Historic Landmark Five Locks Walk are 12 and a half to 13 foot because they eliminated two locks. So they needed to, to make it up. But with this 1850 rerouting, the canal then passes right in front of the canal house. Um, six foot of water. Now, obviously, this is a post-1902 when this section of the canal is closed down. The DNH actually continued running um, east of here until about 1916 or 1917. But back in uh, 2015, when I was president of the Canal Society, before uh, I stepped down and got hired, um, Open Space Institute, New York State Department of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation granted us $800,000 that re resulted in the December 1st 2015 purchase of the Depew Tavern for the Canal Society. And, and I'm proud to say that we've moved into that building. I work out of there, uh, not today, the heat isn't completely in in the basement yet. Um, uh, um, but it, it is our new home. We'll be opening a Mid-Hudson Visitor Center and our new Canal Museum uh, about a year from now. And I'm hoping that uh, when you're all ready to make a road trip, and I think a year from now, we ought to all be ready to make road trips. We'll be, we'll be chomping at the bit at that point. Um, that you'll come and visit us. It's going to be a wonderful facility. We're really proud of the work that we're doing there. And uh, um, we have a wonderful story to celebrate. And we're really happy to, that the state and open space saw fit uh, to purchase this building for us because uh, it really, it's so deeply entrenched in canal history. From 1850 to 1898, the canal company runs a store. They have uh, housing for lock tenders um, and its offices, its paymasters, it, and it's still a tavern. So deep history, it's a wonderful building. It's also remained, it has a, a, an incredible degree of his, historic integrity. It really is like it was made in 1797. This section you can see right here, the original building was just between these two chimneys. In 1827, son Jacob builds uh, this addition because the canal is coming through. In fact, in 1827, it was actually operating in this section. Um, but we're proud, uh, I, I'm proud and the Canal Society is proud of uh, the acquisition of this building and uh, the ability to share it with the public as a community space and as a place to celebrate this really important story. And I'm proud to say too that John Roebling will be uh, um, featured in the technology uh, room of our museum because he was so important to the DNH. There are some people that even think he engineered the DNH, which is a, a major overstatement, but he certainly was important. And while you're here too, here uh, this is actually out on well, it's not part of the Five Locks Walk currently, but we're, we're talking about extending the walk. This is the Anchorage. This is the, the High Falls Aqueduct here on the, uh, the southern side. They're still extant. These anchors go down into the ground where they're anchored to cement, buried, tons and tons of weight. Uh, and the wire that held the suspension, the, 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 the trunks, um, were held by that feature right there. And you can still see it today. Trying to get that slide to change. And it's, it's really great to have it, you know, part of what, why I so enjoy the, uh, the, the DNH story is that it's a, a story that you can, um, you can see today what's going on. Okay, why don't you want to advance? We're only, we're only a few slides in now, but it would still be nice to uh, the islets. Here we go. Finally, uh, and here's that letter to, to Lorenzo Sykes that I, that I, um, referenced earlier, uh, and he just talks about where they are and how, how great they are, and it ends in that quote about how they, they're just, you know, clearly they're very happy and they're letting other people, at this point, as I say, Mr. Sykes is, uh, is working on the Morris Canal, and they must have been perhaps considering uh, they, hiring Mr. Roebling. Um, to my knowledge, they probably used his rope, the, the Morris had, a, had a, a, um, an inclined plane, and I'll bet you they used his wire rope you know, I love when I do these presentations. I always wind up getting questions for myself too. Um, not only do you get questions, I wind up with them as well. Um, but but here he is uh, um, telling telling um, Mr. Sykes just how wonderful the work of John Roebling is. And as I start to wind down here a little, our story, as far as John Roebling goes, is is uh, 
winding down. Just one little more data point, if you will. Here's a great shot of uh, the canal era. This would be before 1914 when the wooden structure of this um, burned down. Interestingly enough, too, um, the, all of these aqueducts, so, uh, so, so most of the locks and everything were 15 foot wide, most of the bridges, most of the aqueducts. In the 1850 final enlargement, all of the work that Roebling did was 19 foot on the top, 17 on the bottom. And I see where they're calculating for a greater depth of water. My assumption, this is a very innovative company that, that embraced new technology at every turn. And that also was always thinking about enlarging. And I can only think that they decided when they built them this time that they built them wider than they needed, anticipating possibly growing larger. But by even 1850, railroads are starting to get where they can carry the weight. Um, they're carrying passengers already. Um, but railroads are starting on the ascendancy. I mean, the DNH runs the first steam locomotive in the Western Hemisphere on their gravity before they even open it. So even they knew the lay of the land, and yet they were immensely successful for the 75 years that they um, that they operated their canal. But uh, the the final final point where John Roman comes into our story during the, the Civil War, I believe in 1863. That's one of the years when the DNH stock pays 30%. They're really successful now, and they're so busy. And they had a lot of problems at the Never Sink Aqueduct, which was at the beginning of their uh, um, what they call the summit level, um, 17 miles of of of, um, of just no no locks at the highest point. And they had a lot of problem with the outflow and stuff. They had a lot of problems with just getting people through. There was so much activity here, and they they wrote to, to John Roebling asking him to build a second. Uh, aqueduct paralleling the first so they could have two-way traffic because these 19 were, were only wide enough, the boats were 14 and a half foot wide, so you couldn't get two into there. Um, Roebling is now working on, I think it's the, is it the Covington? See, Paul, Paul would be able to tell me right off the bat. He's really busy uh, uh, working on uh, on the bridge before the, the East River Bridge, before the, the, um, um, the, the most famous bridge, the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, that he, he demurs, he says he doesn't have time, and in fact, it never happens. And that's really, uh, Roebling goes his way and the, the DNH goes their own way. And, um, and in fact, in 1898, just to bring a little bit of an end to the story, the DNH finally completely abandons its, uh, its canal and puts all of its traffic on railways. In fact, by 1872, they, they leased or controlled or owned railways all the way from New York City to, to Canada. So they were an innovative com company in that regard too. And that, you know, sure they had the canal, but they were working multiple um, means to get their product to market. Yes, Covington Bridge. Thank you, uh, Carol. And actually that came from you, Paul, that's that film merchant there. So at this point, I, I, I open it up for, for questions. I was looking at the chat a little bit. I'm gonna see if there's any. But I mean, if, if you are interested in, in exploring this, uh, uh, more of the history of the DNH, I, uh, I encourage you to go to our, our, of course, to our website, where, as I say, we've got that wonderful Google map. That's a living document that I'll, uh, I just added a new video to it this morning that I'll constantly be updating and adding information. But it's a great resource if you want to go out in the field and see what's there today. You can visit uh, the sites. Let me see the Lackawaxen Aqueduct is on private property. So I guess technically I was trespassing when I took those pictures. The Delaware Aqueduct, you can visit anytime you want. It's administered by the National Park Service. You can park on the uh, Lackawaxen PA end of it and walk across it. Uh, uh, and on the New York side, you can walk along the old canal. There's the remains of two or three of the locks right there. I think it's two of the locks. Um, Lackawaxen, not so much. The Cutabackville, the Never Sink Aqueduct, um, you can see both sides. Um, none of the aqueduct is left, but all of the abutments. And here in High Falls, the one side is technically available with our permission of the DNH Canal Historical Society. The other side is in private hands, but it's on the market. And I would love, if you're rich and you want to help the DNH Canal, I would love to see somebody come in and buy. There's properties where we can continue a DNH trail um, uh, um, into the town of Rosendale. There's two properties right now that if, if I could get the DNH sections of. Um, we could have a, a continued. I, I, as president of the Delaware and Hudson Transportation Heritage Council, I have a vision of a DNH trail from Port Jervis, New York, to the Empire State Trail here in Rosendale. Um, Empire State Trail is a big uh, thing here in New York State. You can uh, you can get on a rail trail in New York City and go all the way to Canada. And in Albany, you can take a detour and go west along the Erie Canal. Uh, um, 
and uh, the, the counties of Orange and Sullivan own the entire DNH bed. And then in the southern part of Ulster, a lot of it's already publicly accessible. So this isn't as, as uh, crazy a scheme as it, as it sounds. Um, but it's, it's an opportunity for people to see these wonderful Roebling, uh, the remains of the Roebling aqueducts and to celebrate this great story that uh, really was an important American story that not enough Americans know. Hi, Bill. Um, you mentioned the five locks walk. Is that what you're also describing here or is that something separate? Um, that's something separate. The five locks walk is, uh, oh, I see, uh, <laughs> it's a national historic landmark. So when they, when they put the canal on the National Historic Register in 68, when they, when they created the register, Udall, the Secretary of the Interior, actually went and um, um, flew over and said, yep, oh, that's important. But they picked out five spots that were, were especially important. Uh, the Honesdale Office building that's now the Wayne County Historical Society, um, the Delaware Aqueduct, the area around the Neversink Aqueduct, the, the High Falls Aqueduct, uh, uh, and that included the Canal House and the five restored locks alongside it and going slightly west. And that's the National Historic Landmark Five Locks Walk here in High Falls, open 24 seven, um, dusk to dawn. Um, we'll be eventually putting up signage and doing more uh, um, interpretation. But actually uh, on my DNH TV YouTube channel, there's a tour from Father's Day last summer. Uh, my do docents, I, I, I videotaped them doing a Facebook live tour of the Five Locks Walk. But you can visit that. We get over a thousand people a week walking it. Uh, we've got a trail counter now. So it's, it's a well, uh, you know, trails in general are trending. And so it's wonderful. It's a, a great opportunity for us to, to take our love of history and combine it with everybody's desire to get out in the outdoors. It's, it's a real perfect storm and good for those of us like my organization, where we have a Mid-Hudson Visitor Center, we expect that to enable, to, to draw thousands of people to the town. And, and a lot of them are now gonna come into my museum, which will, will, will be open, uh, we haven't decided exactly, but will be open a lot more than just the weekends from May and October that we've done for the last decade or so. Will become a true museum. Here in New York State, all of, all of us historical societies that are only open weekends from May to October, aren't open enough to legally be called museums. <laughs> well, we all do it. <laughs> Nobody's come after us. But, um, um, I just wanna hit some of these questions that have come through. I think all the questions that I had written down, you answered, you did a great job of, um, of just giving us so much information that the questions are kind of moot. But we do have this really interesting one from Hillary Miller, um, and she wants to know more about the Roman numerals. She thinks they're amazing. Um, and she asks, did you say that you haven't seen that elsewhere? Um, have you seen it present on non rogling Canal projects? I never saw it anywhere. Paul and I were there about a month ago. We were shooting video at the Delaware Aqueduct because we're, we're gonna do a longer piece with him talking about Roblin's work. So it's one of our video projects. Um, and so we were done at the Delaware and we went over and wanted to go look at the Lacco accent. You know, once, you know, it's so close, it's a half mile away. Uh, and while we were there, we were in the trunk looking over across where the water would have been. And we look and we saw all those numbers. And so I haven't had a chance, you know, I, I looked a little bit on the Delaware aqueduct, but so much of that's covered up. I, I, the next time I'm at the Never Sink, I'm gonna look and see if I can find them. But I did have a minute to go here in High Falls and I found one block with the Roman numerals. But you see that on that one, in the lack of Watson, virtually every stone, they're all labeled. Uh, one source thought that there were depth markers, but that they didn't need depth markers. They knew how much water was in it. But it's very clear if, if you look at that picture and, and every one of them is marked. And it's interesting because their four is four, not IV, you know, but every, every stone has, and, and also um, they're different ways. You know, sometimes it's this way, sometimes it's that way. So clearly they were just marks in the, in the, um, in the quarry so that when the product got there, the masons knew, okay, all the number ones first, uh, and then they built up that pyramid. And as you see it, it, it gradually, uh, um, you know, it graduated. And so the, the stones would have all been particularly cut, but I have, I'm yet to see, I mean, we just discovered this a month ago. So, and with the snow and stuff, I, I will be looking into this more. And part of the reason why I love to have slides like that with the rings too, is get the hive mind. You know, the more people you ask, they're much more likely to get an answer. Uh, um, and I just think it's a fascinating detail that gives you a little window into how did they build these things, you know? So, mm -hmm. so uh, Roebling presumably figured out the size of all the stones. He, they're, so there are drawings and they said, I need a stone like this. And so in the quarry, at least on that project, 
um, they went and numbered every stone, so there was no question. And I look at it, and I'm fascinated because how long do you think it takes to carve Roman numerals into stone? You know, <laughs> it, you know, it's not something you're going to do. It's not like a sharpie, and yet they did it. You know, they, the, 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 you know. So, so we're just starting to try and uncover that little mystery. As I say, I'll, I'll harken back to my comments about how I love this because you go looking for answers, but you always wind up with questions as well. And I, I think that's rewarding. It's not frustrating. It's, it's you know, just more to learn, more to, more to research, more to, you know, more to look into. Absolutely. And sticking with this idea of the craftsmanship of the bridges, um, how is the timber supported by the main cables? Are there suspender cables or suspender rods like you'd see on a road bridge? There are suspender rods um, uh, um, specifically, and again, if, if Paul King will know this detail. Uh, you know, I, I once again want to thank Professor King because I, I know so much more about Roebling, and I've read a lot of the books and stuff. But there's nothing like talking to an architect that knows how they were built for you to understand how they were built. You know, so everybody thinks, for instance, that the the suspension was wire rope, but in fact, it wasn't. It was wires bundled together and painstakingly run one at a time back and forth and they had to be laid just right. And then they had to be put together in that, like in that final slide where you've got your, your cross cut of wire rope. They were put that way and then bound together and then coated with the linseed coating, I think it was. Um, um, and then there were hangers coming down and I believe on all the rolling aqueducts um, uh, that they were just iron, each one was just an iron rod that came down. So the suspenders were there and each one was a different length. And then the, the, the rods come down and the, the wood was across it. But you can see this yourself at the Delaware Aqueduct if you really want to figure it out because it's extant. It's there and it's still supporting. And last I heard, and because it's a highway, they have to investigate it. That wire is still as good as the day they, they strung it in 47 or 48. Um, I guess we're sticking with craftsmanship again. And I do agree the Paul King, um, he's going to come up, he's going to do a talk for us, I believe. We're going to have that scheduled for May. And he's going to have drawings. It's going to be really intense and wonderful uh, in terms of this sort of craftsmanship question. And he has actually, he's the person who's been answering the questions under Bill Merchant. It's actually Paul King, not Bill Merchant. He's just logged in in a confusing way right now. Um, but the last question here is, um, is the upriver side of the base structure the more slanted side? It seems from yes, the photo. Yes, yes. You'll see it on all of the aqueduct pictures, if I have one up, that on the upriver side, they've got a, 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 a piece like this because ice, uh, debris, all sorts of stuff is going to come flooding down in the spring during the freshets. And so you needed something to kind of get it up out of the way to push it this way, to push it that way. And, and on the, on the downriver side, they're all just uh, uh, perfectly <clears throat> more or less square. But you see it even in a picture of the High Falls, the High Falls aqueduct, the stone aqueduct had the exact same feature. And that was, that was to, that was just sort of water management, you know. And yet it didn't save the Lackawaxen Aqueduct during the flood of 1863. <laughs> that center pier went, which meant the whole thing went and had to be rebuilt. Okay. This one is about railroads. Um, was the DNH railroad run by the same people and in the same location of the DNH canal? Same people, not the same location. We get this a lot because people go, oh, just run the railroad on your, on your canal bed. They didn't need to do that. They had that covered already. The canal made the money until it didn't. I don't think they lost money. I think in 98, they finally did a cost benefit. You see this company all along, you know, they try new stuff, innovative stuff. If it doesn't work, they dust themselves off and move on. They embrace new technologies. They're using the telegraph almost immediately. So they had the first team locomotive in the Western hemisphere, the Starbridge Lion. It wound up too heavy for the tracks, so they didn't use it, um, but they tried it. Uh, so they had a railroad, but they had railroads that extended their market. They didn't need to duplicate what they had. So the DH Canal Company in 1898, they sell off the entire canal, cost oh a little cl probably close to two million total to build in, in 18 by 1829, cost more than that to to enlarge in 1850. They sell it for $10,000 to a guy who then sells off part of it to a railroad, and he ends up running cement. It's Kirkendall, Thomas Cornell's son-in-law and heir, and he ends up buying cement plants on this end of things. And so it actually ends up, all the books say it closed in 05, 06. No, I can say definitively from documents in our archives, it was at least open in 1916 and probably 1917, and given enough time, I'll get to the bottom of that one too. And in 1917, one of the biggest 
natural cement companies goes under. And so the canal at that point was mainly functioning to bring coal in from the Hudson River now for the many cement plants, because when they're digging the DNH canal, they discover natural cement right here in High Falls, probably. There's a lot of controversy about exactly where. I'm still trying to nail it down. Um, and so they start the Rosendale cement industry. It becomes a huge industry. More than uh, a half of North America's cement is, is Rosendale cement in the second half of the 19th century and largely moved out in the DNH canal. There's even a, a, a historian who wrote a book or two claiming that the DNH canal existed for the cement which makes him a poor historian in my book, but that's another story. <laughs> but no, the, so the railroad, so in 1898, they, they sell off the canal and they drop canal from their name. They, they're the DNH Railroad. It's the exact same company. And in fact, you get a book called A Century of Progress put out by the DNH Railroad in, in 1928 um, that talks about their first hundred years of, of, uh, of operation. And in fact, the DNH Railroad is a coal railroad until probably the 1950s, 1960s when petroleum and heating oil overtakes the coal industry, and then it just becomes a freight line. It goes bankrupt in 1990. It's bought lock, stock, and barrel by Canadian Pacific. And so now all most of its archives leave Albany. There's a, there's a building in Albany that you can see along the river that was the DNH Railroad offices. And so a lot of that stuff, it's all up in Canada. So that those wonderful maps, that 1854 survey maps, I would love to have the originals. I have one of the one of the reservoir books. So there are two copies, colored and uncolored. There's the originals and then a copy made. And presumably they were in two different offices. They're all in Canada except for the one reservoir book. And they wouldn't let us have the books. Why, why a Canadian railroad wants this material having to do with a New York and Pennsylvania canal? I don't know. I would love to have the originals, but we're very fortunate. We have a, a probably unenforceable, but severe license. So I can't give you a copy of the of the things. Um, but I can use them in my presentations. I can study them. I have them on my devices because when I'm out doing my Where is Our Historian video, I consult these maps because it tells me a great deal. I can tell a story between the map and what's in the ground. And it's probably, you know, I, I love this particular aspect of my job, going out and, and, and talking about what's there today. Um, I think that it, it, it's history that's still palpable. It's present. It's not just in your head. But there's, there's remains of it. I, I'm the lead engineer, or excuse me, the lead historian um, the National Park Service is is revisiting and rewriting the national landmark designation of the DNH Canal in and, uh, and the next two years. And I'm working with the contractor. I'm the lead historian. I gave them a list of 181 extant DNH features, either buried under the ground or where you can see them. Uh, and I'd like to see them all protected, of course. And I, I know where all of them are. I've visited most of them and I'll visit every one. God willing, I live long <laughs> enough. Um, but that, that, that Google map shows you that kind of stuff. Uh, um, it, it gives you the publicly accessible. It talks about where the paths are uh, and where you can go uh, legally and safely. Well, that's been fabulous. Thanks a lot for joining us today. Um, as you've said a few times, um, you guys should go visit the website for, do you want to say it's canalmuseum.org? Co correct. Yes, now I'm, using okay. those. I'm seeing another uh, uh, Carol uh, Simon Levy, I'm going to say, um, did John Roebling witness iron chain or hemp rope failure? Um, I know iron chain, he probably did. Hemp rope, not that I know, but I think he, he, he may not have witnessed it, but uh, he was aware of the failure. The earliest suspension bridges were in France and then England, and they had failures. Um, um, but it's hard to say, you know, his wire rope, he was probably inspired engineers in, in Germany, well, it wasn't really Germany, it was a bunch of little city states, because they don't unite until, what, 72, 1872. Um, but, you know, people talk about, oh, yeah, you could make, uh, you could make rope out of wire. But to my knowledge, Roebling's the first guy to do it. So he moves to Saxonburg, they're going to be sheep farmers, which is it's kind of mind-boggling, because there's nothing in his background to make you think that man was going to be a farmer. Um, uh, well, they, they fail as, as, as farmers. Well, it winds up in Pennsylvania. The Germans had been settling since the 18th century. All the good land was gone. Saxonburg was not good land for farming, which is probably why there were going to be sheep herders, because you didn't need such good land for sheep. Um, in the end, that didn't work out. And that's when he starts. He starts working as a surveyor, and he starts making wire rope. And then he starts finding people to use his wire rope. Uh, in fact, he actually gives it to them uh, um, with the caveat that they'll purchase it if it works out, I think, and is one of his earliest railroads and it was the gravity railroads where he first started so he, he was aware of the failure of iron chain bridges um the hemp rope failure might have been brought to his attention by archbald 
when they bought in 1844, they purchased wire rope for the gravity and kind of never looked back, you know, uh, it, it, that technology. And it, it's so, that's so much like the DNH Canal Company, as I say, to embrace these new technologies, you know, to have the telegraph line and to use it regularly. They were a very forward thinking uh, company. They really wanted all their boats out on the Hudson River, but that didn't work out for a variety of, of reasons. So they just, by, by 1890, they're on the cover of Scientific American with the, the technology they're now using to make unloading the boats quicker. Uh, and this is just the kind, they were a real American, you know, can do kind of developing the corporation. Everybody says that railroad companies developed the modern corporation. No, no, it was the canal companies first who turned into railroads like the DNH. All right, well, we're at two o'clock um, and I just want to spotlight Vicky's comment. You are a wealth of information and I think she's correct. I think that you've got a lot more hours to talk about this topic. We really narrowed your focus to Roebling, but there's still so much more to learn about DNH and I hope everyone does. I hope to visit um, your museum, the new one when it does open. So I, I'd also recommend that you guys do go to his website. Do you guys have like a newsletter? I'm gonna to try to sign up for that if you have yeah, one. We have a newsletter that, that, uh, that so when you become a member, you get, uh, we're doing three a year now. But you know, if you go to canalmuseum.org, the link to the, the, the Google map link is there. Uh, it's there for people's enjoyment and, and come back. It's a living document. And DNH TV, we, we uh, at the beginning of COVID staff got together and said, you know, we kept saying we're gonna do more online. We now have a, a DNH TV. We've got 60 some odd video from short pieces to presentations like these. I think this will be the sixth presentation when this gets up that I've done that's on DNH TV. There's our virtual museum tour. There's a tour of my old museum, beloved, but now completely gone. We've sold the building. It's financing our new museum. That particular leg of DNH TV is now behind the scenes. So uh, next week, you'll see some video that I shot as the house is being restored. It's pretty fascinating, if I do say so myself. Uh, and so the virtual museum is that. And then we've got Where is Our Historian, where in, in the uh, in the off, you know, in, in the spring, winter, and fall, now it's too snowy now for me to do it. But I, I, I love to go out in the field and shoot video talking about some of those 181 uh, extant sites of the DNH, talking about what's there in the ground now and what was back uh, during the historic era. All right. Well, thanks a lot, everyone, for joining us. Um, and we'll be doing more Roebling Road Trips. You can check our website for information. There's going to be one about the Golden Gate Bridge coming up soon. Um, and a lot of, we got other coals in the fire. Is that the saying? Ooh, um, just cool. stay tuned. All right. So have a good day, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks, Bill.